Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Nice to see you. <laughs> How are you doing? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, really nice to be back in BGF. I, uh, I haven't actually been to Malaysia for about four years, I think, maybe 2019. And um, Mm. I think at that time I would have been sharing at uh, BGF as well. So it feels a little bit strange. I feel like I've kind of lost contact a little bit. So it's nice to be back and nice to connect with, with everyone and reconnect with some, uh, some old friends as well. So this evening I have this, this topic in fact, I would like to write a book called Relaxation and Realization. I really like the flow of the, the two words. And for me, I find that both of these are very uh, important aspects of the Buddha's teachings. The first one, relaxation. As you know, living in a modern, in modern culture, modern city, uh, it's a little bit hard to relax. We're so stimulated. We've got so much information coming to us, especially now with our, our phones. Just a little reminder, you might like to just check that your phone is um, off and silent. Um, so that we are getting quite a lot of stimuli from many different sources especially if you work or if you go to school, if you're studying, if you've got um, children, if you've got family, even you have parents to look after, a lot of people in your life, then there's a lot of stimulation coming to you. So with that stimulation, and then of course our foods that we eat and other things that we do may stimulate us uh, physically, we then find it difficult to relax. Now, what I found, because I've done much the opposite to what nearly all of you have done in my adult life, well, I was 29 when I discovered the teachings of the Buddha, uh, that was Vipassana, and for the last 30 years I've been doing pretty much only Vipassana. So that's my, my area of expertise. That's what I love, that's what I practice, that's what I share. So I found that relaxation is probably one of the most important things that anyone or everyone can learn in their lifetime. How to relax, how to put yourself into a state of if you like, complete relaxation. Now, for most people, they would think that that is just falling asleep. Because that's what many people do when they try to meditate. Anybody fallen asleep when they're trying to meditate lately or at any time? It happens like you don't even see it coming. It's like a, a silent train that, that comes and just knocks you out. So it's very, very normal for you to have sleepiness. But again, what that is, is an indicator that in your life, you are stressing yourself and running on what I call nervous energy. So when I teach retreats, and I've just been teaching, I've just done four retreats in Bali. When people come on retreat, the first day is almost a waste of time. It's like nobody can hear anything I'm talking about. They're sitting there and they're going, they're falling asleep because they've stopped running and rushing. And all of a sudden, they've got nothing to do. They're just sitting there and I'm talking. And some people say my voice puts, pe puts them to sleep. Um, I, I once put about 40 children to sleep by talking to them. <laughs> I did lay them down. It was after lunch and I said, okay, we're going to do lying meditation. And kids are so excited. It was on a youth camp. Oh, it was a kids camp actually. 
And normally they were so excited and they don't want to sleep and they want to run around and everything. But I gradually calmed them all down. We did metta. And besides about three kids, I think almost 40 of the kids were asleep. So it was partly my voice <laughs> and partly the metta and partly because kids also run and run and run and talk and talk and talk and almost exhaust themselves. So we are quite good at pushing ourselves and forcing ourselves and getting the job done, which is really good, especially if you're a mother or you know, you're working for some, somebody, you need to get the job done, that's fine. But many of us also are what I would call perfectionists, which means that we have to get it right and we have to do it you know, on time, the fastest time. It has to be the best. It has to be perfect. And if you're a person that is a perfectionist, and many of us are secretly kind of covered up, that we are always forcing ourselves and pushing ourselves to get things right, to do things better, to do things... There's nothing wrong with improving, nothing wrong with getting things right, but it's the stress you cause yourself to keep pushing and trying to be better and better all the time. So there's a balance, and that's what I'm going to start uh, talking about eventually, is finding a balance between being relaxed and energized. And this is a really, it's a very delicate balance, but it's also a very beautiful balance. Have you ever heard that the Buddha's teaching is called the middle way? Yeah, it's a common term for the Buddha's teachings. I really love this term, the middle way. In this world, I see there is yin and yang, the yin and yang of, of this world, the opposites of this world. And there's the, the light and the dark and the good and the bad and the beautiful and the ugly and the pleasant and the unpleasant. And it goes into almost all areas of life. But what the Buddha was teaching was something in the middle. It, it, was, it was like, it's almost as if there is an exit out of yin and yang. Yin and yang can also mean heaven and hell. So the Buddha's teaching is something in between. It's not heaven, it's not hell, it's not sukha, it's not dukkha. Oh, wait. <laughs> Luckily, I, I remembered what shirt I wore today. <laughs> yes, neither sukha nor dukkha. This is a very beautiful teaching by the Buddha. Neither sukha nor dukkha, neither pleasant nor unpleasant. And this upekha, is something in between. It's not just neutral. Anyway, most people would see neutral and say, oh, neutral's boring, or neutral's negative, or neutral's, it's not pleasant, so I don't like neutral. So we, we, we discard neutral. But the word upeka doesn't necessarily mean neutral. It means neither sukha nor dukkha, neither pleasant nor unpleasant. So it's something in the middle. It's not the yin, it's not the yang. It's, not, it's neither of those. It's like the Buddha found the gap in between yin and yang, the gap between heaven and hell, the gap between right and wrong. You know the, the, the terminology for enlightenment, is the, it, one of them is the extinguishing of karma or the n no longer producing karma. What karma are we talking about? We're talking about positive or negative, wholesome or unwholesome. So what is this point that's perfectly in the middle? It's a, it's a perfect balance point. So that's this, this upeka, which also is... Um, um, it's not... There's a different term for enlightenment, that's nibbana. So upeka is, um, it's a very beautiful and peaceful state. However, it's also, when you experience it, it's also very, very 
alive, very real, very, your mind is very clear. So it's not a sleepy, lazy kind of state. It's, it's powerful. So there's this, this place between being completely relaxed and being completely energized. Fully alert, but fully relaxed. So what I want to share with you tonight is how to go into a state of relaxation but keep your mind awake. And that is probably what I would call a perfect state for meditation, especially in Vipassana. <coughs> but also to practice Samatha as well. A perfectly relaxed mind, but a perfectly awake and aware mind. So, I'd like to uh, lead you into a very simple relaxation. So we won't do a lying meditation. I won't put you all to sleep. However, you may, uh, you may experience a little bit of sleepiness. Sleepiness is okay. You know, sleep is, sleepiness is a normal and natural mental state. Watch the nature of it. It comes and it goes. When you feel that little nod in when you are when you are sitting and trying to meditate, when you feel that nod, then just quickly re rewind your mind and ask, "What was I doing just before that happened?" In that way, you will teach yourself the state that precedes the sleepiness. And as a meditator, if you are a meditator and you would like to improve in meditation then to get that skill to see sleepiness before it happens, that is a very skillful state of mind, to be able to catch it before it happens. It's like you're driving down the highway and there's a big tunnel, a big tunnel through the mountain. And, but about one kilometer before the tunnel, there's a sign and it says, tunnel ahead one kilometer. What's a tunnel? It's a very dark place, isn't it? You know, not much happening in there. It's very dark, like sleepiness. So, and then as you get closer, tunnel 500 meters, tunnel 200 meters, you know, tunnel 100 meters, switch your headlights on. It's telling you, giving you the warning sign, saying there's a tunnel up ahead. So there's, it's sleepiness is like that as well. When you, you can see the causes for sleepiness before sleepiness happens and then you won't be sleepy. So this is one of the skills of a mindfulness meditator or a vipassana meditator. It doesn't mean that we are stopping sleepiness or we're killing sleepiness or we're getting rid of sleepiness. You just don't need to go into sleepiness. You now have a choice about how you want to use your mind. So this is really skillful. It's really skillful for people who are working a lot and feel sleepy, uh, people who are studying as well and feeling sleepy. So one of the best things you can do, in fact, is just do a five minute lying meditation. Just lay down on the hard floor, no pillow, no cushion, no, nothing comfortable. Don't go and jump in your bed because you, you, you'll be there for an hour or two. So don't get comfortable, even on the floor, don't even put a cushion down. Just lay on the hard floor and just for five minutes, even if you want to set your, your clock, your timer, just for five minutes or ten minutes. And you can even do this at work, I, I think, I don't know, don't know what your boss is like, but if there's a quiet room or you've got your own office or something or a little piece of floor there, I tell you what, if you start to do that and you know when you get up you feel fresh you feel alert because you do a short sleep like a, a micro nap a nano nap or a nanny nap um, you can you feel very fresh very alert and you didn't go into deep sleep so if you
can show your friends at work that you can do this and that you are more productive. Your boss might even also be interested and uh, you never know, you might, you might be putting 40 employees to sleep with the sound of your voice <laughs> and a little alarm to wake you back up in 10 minutes. <clears throat> so. Uh, that was just to tell you that you may experience a little bit of sleepiness because you are tired. So when you become still and your mind, and you close your eyes, then it's almost like the mind signal, oh, it must be sleeping time. So sometimes if you're a person who gets really sleepy, maybe better to just open your eyes and just stare at the floor about one meter ahead of you. Um, many of the Buddha images, uh, the Buddha is usually has his eyes open, just downcast about just in, in front. So that's a very legitimate way to practice meditation, especially if you are uh, experiencing sleepiness. Uh, the Zen Buddhist monks in Japan, they, they sit facing a wall and they keep their eyes open. So they meditate with their eyes open. But then if you do fall asleep, the chief, the head monk, comes around and smacks you with the sticks. <laughs> that wakes you up and wakes everybody else up. So, mm, it's going to be, so it's only relaxation, okay? Oh, great, thanks, beautiful. No, it's okay. I'll, I'll be the bell. <laughs> Come into a position where you don't need to move, just for about five minutes. Now you'll notice that I've used the word relaxation. I didn't use the other word that starts with M. Just feel your body here and now. Feel your body connected to the floor. Feel your body touching the cushion, wherever it touches. Feel the weight of your body. Feel the gravity pulling your body down to earth. Bring your awareness to your left foot, just your left foot. Feel the big toe of your left foot. Notice your mind right now. Did it become very quiet? It's really simple. Now, can you feel the toenail of the big toe of your left foot? Look at your mind focusing but it's relaxed. Or check to see if your mind is relaxed. Are you squeezing your mind to focus and find that sensation? Or is it just there? Now feel your right foot. Feel your right knee. And your left hand. Feel your right shoulder. and your left ear and the very top of your head. Just imagine somebody's lifting you up by a few hairs right in the center of your head and just lift up a little bit, straighten your spine, grow taller by one or two centimeters. Lift yourself up and roll your shoulders back and down. And now relax in this upright posture. And as you breathe in, feel the cool air coming into your body, through your nose. And as you breathe out, feel the warm air coming out. Again, feel the cool air coming in. Feel the warm air going out.
Every breath is different. Every breath is new. You will never have this breath again. Notice how the cool sensor sensation appears and disappears, and then the warmth of the outbreath appears and disappears. Check your mind. Are you relaxed? Was the mind in the past or the future? Were you worrying about work or kids or traffic or other things? Come back to your breath. That cool sensation appears and disappears. The warm out-breath sensation appears and disappears. Is your body still? Can you feel the stillness of the body, the whole body? Can you just simply observe stillness, not a part of the body, just the whole body, but just stillness itself? And what's on the screen of your mind? Can you just clear the screen of your mind? Can you just see blank or black? Just empty the screen of the mind, like you delete the screen. Nothing on the screen. And can you hear any silence in your mind? Just silence. Silence in the background. Stillness in the body. Space in the mind. And silence. And is the breath still breathing? Is the big toe still on your left foot? See how abstract that may seem now. How about those few hairs at the top of your head? What else do you want to be aware of right now? What is, it, what is naturally occurring in your field of awareness now? Perhaps hear some sounds. Perhaps some sensations in the body. Perhaps sleepiness. Maybe thoughts are popping in, popping out. Maybe there's a main thought, a story, still running from today. Can you just see it? Just notice. Ah, oh, it's just thinking. Thinking, thinking. Seeing, seeing. Hearing, hearing. Feeling, feeling. Breathing in, breathing out. And relaxing. What if we just let everything come and go, but stay aware, awake, alert? Just check your mind now. 
Are you aware? The question is, am I aware? Am I relaxed? Am I present? Am I safe? Am I peaceful? Am I healthy? And this can lead us into metta. I am safe, peaceful and healthy. I am safe, peaceful and healthy. May you be safe, peaceful and healthy. And you can share this with anyone you wish. Any friend, any relative, someone from work, someone you know, maybe your teacher, teachers, or just generally. May my friends be safe, peaceful and healthy. May my family be safe, peaceful and healthy. May all my teachers be safe, peaceful and healthy. May all my Dharma friends be safe, peaceful and healthy. And again, gently come back to your body. Come back to your senses. And when you're ready, feel free to open your eyes. Be aware of seeing. Look around with awareness. Color, light, shape. Feel free to move, relax, have a stretch. Relax, really sit comfortably. How was your relaxation? Did it work? Yeah? Was it okay? <laughs> Some sleepiness? A little bit? No? No? A few, few yes, a few no. Yeah, it's normal. Back pain, yeah, of course, some pain comes as well, yeah, and especially if you're not sitting, not used to sitting in this position, also you can start to feel some discomfort, uh, it's also normal. So, as I've already shared with you, what I practice and have been practicing for 30 years and what I share is the teaching of Vipassana, the practice of developing mindfulness and uh, concentration and insight. So, the beautiful, and what I teach now, I call what I do freestyle vipassana. Because when you go to Myanmar, you'll find this school of vipassana and that school of vipassana and that school. There are so many schools of vipassana. Many of you are, are very much aware of that. However, when I'm teaching in foreign countries, they've only ever heard of one kind of vipassana. That's the Goenka vipassana, the silent 10-day boot camp um, uh, meditation experience, which is quite wonderful. Uh, it's beautiful. I'm, I'm so glad um, that uh, Goenkaji could, could uh, establish vipassana all over the world, I think there's over a hundred centers and more of other centers. There are vipassana retreats being run all year round, all around the world, largely because of him. 
it's it's not necessarily Buddhist. So there's no Buddha image in there. He speaks about Buddha and Buddhism and other Buddhist principles, but it's not. It's open for everybody. So it's it's quite brilliant actually, but it's a copy paste retreat. So you do a ten day retreat here. And then, because there are centers here, I know there's one, there used to be anyway, one here in Malaysia, maybe two, um, where whenever you go for a 10-day course, it's the same teaching. So it's just copy-paste, and there's, it's recorded videos of Goenka teaching. Actually, it's quite brilliant. It's, it's really, really amazing teachings. But, so many people think, oh, Vipassana is just, sitting meditation and um, you know uh, doing some anapanasati for a few days and then scanning the body for um, sankharas. So yes, that is a style of vipassana. But then my teacher teaches the um, Mahasi Siado technique of vipassana, which is the mental labeling and the rising and falling of the abdomen. And then there are so many different types. There's Sunlun Vipassana and there's Mogok Vipassana and um, so many other schools of Vipassana. Uh, and then I also follow Siado Utejaniya, uh, teaching, he teaches often with um, Bhante Agachita and Bhante Kumara at uh, SBS. And yeah, so. Uh, that's where I learnt the freestyle from him. And then it made me reflect, and, I, and then when I look back at the Satipatthana Sutta, actually the Buddha wasn't teaching Vipassana, he was teaching Satipatthana. So Satipatthana isn't Vipassana, and if you just take Satipatthana and you take all the, the elements and practice them, there is no Vipassana, actually there is no Satipatthana either, but that's why I refer to it as freestyle, because then people know, oh, it's not this type of vipassana or that type of vipassana, this is just freestyle vipassana. So what I'm, I'm getting people to do really is just live in the experience of your body and mind in the present moment. My teacher, Chan, Chanmye Siado, uh, Siado Ujanika, he so often repeated the principle of vipassana. The principle of vipassana is to observe any mental or physical process that is predominantly arising in the present moment. Just repeated it so many times. It's imprinted in my, in my mind. The principle of vipassana meditation is to observe any mental or physical phenomenon, is his word, that arises, that predominantly arises in the present moment. The word there that is most important to me is predominantly. So just check yourself now, what is predominant in your experience? So for our friend here, maybe the pain in the shoulders is the predominant experience. Now what this principle says is observe the most predominant. So it's not saying get rid of the back, the shoulder pain, or uh, stop having shoulder pain, or go and sit in a chair, or do something else. Observe. So what is the best way to observe? Is to relax. What happens when you when you feel pain in your body? What do you do? You usually tense up. And especially in the area where you have the pain, and often that's what pain is, the area around the pain has already tensed up. And so it gets tighter. And that's sometimes what the pain is, is the tightness. There might be something that caused the pain, but then all the muscles around it try to protect it and create pain, which can then create some other areas of discomfort in the body as well. I've done this myself and I've done it with many of the students or people who come on retreats, I ask them, when you feel pain, just allow yourself to feel the pain. 
relax the pain, the area of the pain. Because you're tightening up around the pain, and also in your mind, you're resisting the pain. You're saying, oh, pain, oh, this is my old my sports injury or you know my work gave me this pain or my kids gave me a pain in the neck or you know a pain in the butt or whatever however you get your pains so can you firstly so the first thing is mindfulness you just aware of it i use awareness and mindfulness some other teachers differentiate my english is not that good so I just, I don't care. Awareness, mindfulness, same thing to me. Sati, yeah, sati is, is the word. Firstly, be aware. Oh, there's a pain. Okay. Can I accept the pain? Just accept it. Don't do anything with it. Don't resist it. Because acceptance is the opposite of resistance. So normally, when you, not only pain do you resist in life, but anything that is dukkha, anything unpleasant, anything that you don't want, you resist it. What you resist, as they say these days, what you resist persists. And actually resisting something that's unpleasant is actually creating more unpleasantness. You're creating more dukkha. Some dukkha arises in your body and mind, and what do you do? You resist it. The resistance is also dukkha. So you're doubling your dukkha, and you don't even know that you're doing it. You just think that's normal. Actually, it's normal, but it's not necessary. So when you see your mind doing that, you remind yourself. This is the important part of the teachings. Actually, sati also means to remember. It doesn't just mean to be aware. It also means to remember. To remember to be aware, to remember to be present. Remember to accept it. And that's wisdom. A little bit of wisdom that says, oh yeah, it's just pain. Or that's what the body does. Or pain is natural. Pain is energy. Pain is a combination of the four elements. Or this is just a sense of feeling. It comes through the door of, of feeling, one of the five senses. It's just a feeling, just a sensation. Remind yourself in any way that you understand what a pain is. And you just say, it's just pain. And you just allow it to be present. Even verbally in your, well, maybe not out loud, but you can if you're alone, but give it permission. Say, I allow you to be present, pain. I accept you. It, it's not really, <laughs> it's not really good teachings, <laughs> but <laughs> it's kind of, <laughs> kind of fun and a little bit imaginary. Once I was meditating, <laughs> once, 10,000 times I was meditating. No. Once I was meditating, and in Myanmar, when I was a monk, and I was in the middle of a long retreat, and about, about one hour into the meditation, about 45 minutes, one hour, the pain would always come, and a particular pain would come. So it was like I could almost expect it. So one day the pain came, and it's like it knocked on the door. It was like, hey, I'm here. I'm like, oh. you know, normally I'm like, oh, pain, like go away, resisting. But this day I changed my attitude. I'm not sure why. And I said, oh, pain. Oh, hi. Come in. I opened the door and said, come in. I said, would you like to sit in my seat? Said, sit in my seat. And I said, kick your shoes off, like sit by the fire. You know, would you like a cup of tea? Would you like a cold drink? You know, can I get you something? You know, just put your feet up, relax. So I said to Pain, just make yourself at home. And as I said that, I walked out the door and I said, because this is not my home. And I closed the door. So in this, and I didn't plan this, it was just a little scenario that played out in my mind where I started to talk to the Pain and I just, I just said, do whatever you want. So my attitude completely changed. 
And it was almost like I was making friends with my pain. I was saying, it's okay, you can be here. There's no problem. You don't, I don't have to fight with you. I don't have to get rid of you. I don't have to change you or do anything. You can be here. I'm, it's fine. But then it was funny how my mind at the end said, because this is not my home, as I left. That was a little bit of wisdom, a little bit of Dharma coming through that's saying, well, this body isn't my home. You know, I don't, these elements don't belong to me. It's not, yes, I, I appear to live here, but there's a, a relinquishing and a letting go and allowing it to be as it is. And often what happens when you change your attitude to pain, your mind calms down. When your mind calms down, the pain also calms down. Even if you like, you can direct your mindfulness towards the painful area and even just say, relax. And just soften that painful area just by the word relax or calm or peace or even metta. You can do metta for a part of your body if you like. It's not a living being as such, but it's certainly part of and you can just, it's just metta, you can play with it. It's, there's no real rules about it. There are some for deep, serious meditation. But just for general life, you can say, may my knee be safe and peaceful and healthy. I love my knee. May my knee be strong. May my knee be, uh, work well and be, you know, in harmony with the rest of the body. And you can just play with it and just bless your knee or bless your pain, bless your back. And what's happening is you're shifting your attitude out of resistance, fighting, struggling, trying to change, trying to control, trying to manipulate, trying to make things the way that you think they should be and actually allow them to be exactly as they are. There is something that probably all of us have heard ever since we started listening to the Dharma or since we learnt meditation. Meditation is, and often the Buddha's teachings, is also referred to as seeing things as they really are. You heard this? To see things as they really are. I think I heard that 30 years ago when I first came to the practice. At first it's a bit confusing, it's like, well, why am I not seeing things as they really are? Was I doing something wrong? Like, what am I not seeing? As time goes by, you start to understand what it really means to see things as they really are. Something simple like your breath, for example. We breathe, we're breathing in or out every moment of our existence. It's like you don't have much choice about that. You can stop it if you want, but the breath is either on an in-breath or an out-breath. Then, when you really feel, like we just did, just feeling the cool sensation of the in-breath, the warm sensation of the out-breath. And your mind is not thinking. You're only feeling the sensation of the in-breath. Or I can say, only feeling coolness. It's like, before coolness arises, you're not feeling anything. The coolness arises, it exists for a short moment, one or two moments, and then it passes away and it disappears. Just feel it now while I'm talking. The coolness appears and it disappears. And then the warmth of the outbreath, it appears and it disappears. There's warmth and then there's no warmth. There's coolness and then there's no coolness. Now if you just feel that coolness and there's no thought, there's no past, there's no future, there's even no nose. There's no breathing, there's no body breathing, because your mind is only on the sensation of coolness. 
When your mind is purely in the sensation of coolness, there's no I, there's no me, there's no you, there's no place, there's no, there's nothing, actually there's nothing, there's simply coolness. Even that coolness is just a concept that we describe a particular sensation. There is only the sensation and the mind that is aware of it. At that point, there's, the mind is completely calm, completely relaxed, and it's just seeing things as they really are. Your ego is not complicating it. It's not labeling it or trying to change it, fix it, correct it or do anything with it. It's not about the past, it's not about the future. This is a pure sensation that just happened in this moment and now it's gone. And then there's another pure sensation that happens in this moment and it's gone. If you can just keep doing that, even if it's just one in-breath and then one out-breath. So I love to ask people, People say, oh, I can't meditate. It's like, oh, I can't, can't, um, my mind can't stay still. I say, okay, just see, and you just do it now, can you take an in-breath without any thought? Can you have an out-breath without any thought? Now have an in-breath and an out-breath without any thought. It's not very difficult, is it? Huh? Can you do that? <laughs> Some are not so sure, but yeah, <laughs> it's like, yeah, I think I can do it. Can you do it, bud? You can't do it. <laughs> You're sleepy. <laughs> very simple. If you can do one in breath, and one out breath without any thought, just repeat that. And one in breath and one out breath without any thought. And an in breath and an out breath without any thought. Not only are you seeing the breath as it is, but you're actually, you're actually seeing, you're seeing anicca and you're seeing anatta. But what are you not seeing? You're not seeing dukkha. There's no dukkha there. You're not suffering. What's to suffer? There's no suffering. There's nobody there to suffer. There's only an experience of a sensation and an awareness of a sensation. There's only two things, nama and rupa, that's all. Body and mind. That is seeing things as they really are. So when you then zoom back out to your life, and you're in the shopping center or you know you're driving your car or you're at the office or you're looking after the kids or whatever you're doing how then do you see things as they really are a good way is to be aware of your senses actually another really good way and this is also what utejaniya teaches is to just ask what i asked earlier am i relaxed It's a really good question. Am I relaxed? If you're in the shopping center or you know, you're trying to do some task or achieve something, get something, fix something, then you're probably not relaxed. So then, why don't, uh, why don't you ask yourself, why am I not relaxed? And find the reason inside yourself. Don't say, oh, it's because of the traffic or because of the children or because of the boss or because of all those things. Oh, because I got this email, because I got this message, oh, because it's too noisy or something. All of those are out there. Before, when we meditated, I asked, I said, can you feel the stillness of your body? This is actually a little key. It's really a key to achieving what I was trying to share with you. Instead of observing the body, observe the stillness. Stillness is somewhat abstract. If you observe the body, then you're stuck with sensations and arms and legs and all sorts of things. Can you observe stillness? 
and it's relative stillness because the body is never perfectly still. But just the fact that there is no intentional movement. And you only observe stillness. And then I said, clear the screen of your mind. Have no pictures or anything in your mind. Actually, I think everybody can do that. Just blank your mind. Just, screen, just clear the screen so that you don't see anything. And then I asked, can you hear the silence in your mind? the silence in your mind. Because your mind is silent when you're not talking to yourself. But if you ask yourself, is my mind silent? Do it now. Just ask yourself, is my mind silent? <laughs> is it? No? What was it doing? Singing a song? Was it talking to itself? Answer you back. It answered me back. <laughs> you answered yourself back. What was it? Yes or no? <laughs> Did it answer you back? Basically, no. I mean, it's not exactly. Uh, right. Okay. Okay, ask this question. What is my next thought? Just do it again. Ask yourself, what is my next thought? What happened? No thought? Nothing? Nothing happened, right? Nothing happened because there's no thought. It's funny. This is called the fastest meditation in the world. <laughs> it's all yours. It's for free. You can play this do this with your kids and your friends and your family, even your mother and father if you want. It's like you don't have to meditate, but let's do this. And you just say, ask yourself, what is my next thought? It's like you're literally, your mind has to stop thinking to see if it's thinking. It goes, oh, am I thinking? Oh, no, I'm not thinking. Even for a split second. So, um, what did I ask you? Is the mind silent? That's not normally the question I ask. I asked it tonight for the first time. Is the mind silent? Usually, I think, for my mind, it does the same thing. It just goes silent. It's like, oh yes, it's silent. Because you kind of have to stop to see if it's silent. And in that silence, it's silent. So, maybe it was uh, your... It depends how fast your answer came to the question, because there might have been a microsecond of, of silence in there. So these are my three accesses to purification of mind. Stillness, space, and silence. Stillness in the body is also dissolving the body. It's going beyond the body. It's just looking at the stillness. The space is the clarity of the mind. Nothing on the screen. And then the silence is there's no talking in the mind. The mind is silent. Stillness, space, and silence. And even if you're just there for a moment, you just fall into that. It's enough. Because what it's doing is it's showing you that there is a possibility for the purification of mind. And if you come to Buddhism through what, as we are, Theravada Buddhism, especially through my teacher's teaching, which my teacher and his teacher, um, Mahasi Syadaw, they loved to follow the Visuddhimagga, Paok Syadaw also, as far as I know, is following the Visuddhimagga, which is a compendium of the Buddha's teachings. A very clever monk, a Sri Lankan monk, if I'm not mistaken, called Buddha Gosa. He, he took all the Buddha's teachings and he wrote it into one book. It's a pretty heavy, thick book. And in there, there's uh, many different meditation techniques. It's also called 
Visuddhimagga uh, is the path of purification. And so our teachers, what they're teaching is the purification of mind. And this also is one of the main points of the Buddha, is to purify the mind. So you can achieve this through, the, uh, through what I've been sharing with you. One of the main things that I find is that if you can relax your mind, so remember I said just be aware of your big toe on your left foot. Do you, do you remember how quiet your mind was at that moment? It's like, because I just randomly say, ch chose a part of the body, and you went, huh? My left, my left foot, my, huh? my big toe. Oh, and again, in that moment, your mind just goes quiet going, oh yeah, I've got a big toe on my left foot. Oh. And it's like, I mean, you, maybe you were talking to yourself like I was, just, oh yeah, I've got a big toe on my left foot. But usually, people just go, huh? And the mind just goes quiet, and there you are, right in the present moment. And it doesn't matter what part of the body that you pay your attention to. And then I went through, you know, your right knee and, you know, different parts of the body, the shoulder and such. And often when you just zoom in on one little part of the body, the mind becomes quiet. You're giving your mind something to do. So we do that with the breathing as well. People have been practicing breathing meditation for thousands of years. And it still works. It's a fantastic way to purify your mind. So, by calming your mind on a single object in the present moment, this not only calms the mind, it's relaxing the mind, but then it's also purifying the mind, and you're also seeing things as they really are. There are probably a lot more other benefits to that as well but those are certainly enough for the time being. So through relaxation, you can achieve realization. Realization, according to the teachings, is, in Buddhist teachings, to see things as they really are, to understand the Dhamma as it really is. And the Dhamma is already what we're experiencing. It's what makes up everything that we are. I love the fact that uh, Dhamma um, is, can also translate as natural law. So the Buddha wasn't teaching a religion. He was teaching about the nature of body and mind, the nature of physicality and mentality, the nature of the world, the nature of life. To me, this is more like a science lesson. It's more like a, a, a biology les lesson. It's like a, a psychology teaching, not just, um, oh, you have to do this or you have to do that or you can't do this and you can't do that and, you know, you all should do this or follow me, I know the way or something like this. It's really a set of guidelines or not only a set of guidelines but something that can be practiced and experienced. So one of, the, one of my last points tonight, and I've already made it, I'll just reiterate, and that is that when we... It's about the purification of the mind. The very simple breakdown of the Buddha's teachings, not only do, can we call it the middle way, but we can also call it... Um, uh, the Buddha said, to do that which is good, to, um, uh, sorry, avoid harm, do good, and purify the mind. So simple. Avoid harm, do good, and purify the mind. The last point, the purification of the mind, is really the releasing us from the dukkha. So, but in order to do, to understand what harm you may be doing, you need mindfulness. And you need wisdom to be able to know what is the difference between harmful and harmless, and um, 
wholesome and unwholesome. If it's unwholesome, then you refrain from it. That's mindfulness and wisdom. And then do what is good. You need mindfulness and wisdom to do that as well. And then the purification of the mind. You need the um, sati samadhi panya. I think I've talked enough, haven't I? <laughs> and um, it's enough for talking anyway. So would you like to ask some questions or what time are we finishing? Okay. Our time is till 9.30, but we can open for questions and answers. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Brother Jeff, for your very insightful and uh, your guided meditation and insightful talk as well. So let us say sadhu three times. Thank you. Sadhu, sadhu. I also call sadhu to you and to myself. <laughs> So, brothers and sisters, we will now open the floor for Q&A. So, we'll just, um, this will be a free flow question and answers yeah, and discussion. Sure. Freestyle. Freestyle yeah. Q&A mm -hmm. with Brother Jeff Oliver. So, if you have any questions, please raise your hand and I'll bring the mic over to you. So, something I just said now was, I say sadhu, sadhu, sadhu to myself, which sounds a bit odd, doesn't it? But this teaching that I've shared with you tonight, I've never heard it before. As you can see, I didn't, I'm not reading from notes or something like that. So this arises spontaneously. So this also is the beauty of the Dhamma, that when you, when you practice it, well, you practice it, but you also live by it. Every day you're getting new insights and new realizations. So you're really living in the Dhamma. So then for myself i'm lucky enough to have these opportunities where i'm able to share what i what i experience so um so i've not heard this talk tonight either this was the first time and we'll never hear it. well i was going to say we'll never hear it again but it's been recorded so maybe maybe we will hear it again we'll see what happens yeah so please if you'd like to ask any questions I'm happy to listen to them. <laughs> All right. Sadhu, uh, teacher, Jeff. Um, re recently, right, I actually learned uh, from this Pante Indaratana. Uh, he, 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 he was asking, like, you try just observation on your, on your thoughts for 30 minutes every day. So uh, it's not even a formal meditation. You just observe the thoughts. So what I experienced that 30 minutes, right? At one point, right? I can't even feel where's the position of my hands. Mm. I, even my awareness go to that uh, part of my hands, right? I, 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 it seems like I can't figure out where's the weight with the hands. Mm. Mm, in such experience, huh, what is actually happening in mm. behind? Okay, so just let me clarify, were you your practice was to sit for 30 minutes yes. and just be aware of your thoughts. Yes. Okay. I like it. Um, so, did the teacher call that meditation? No. No. Okay. So, that was what I did tonight also. I said, let's do relaxation. And I said, I didn't say the M word. <laughs> because it, it's funny, but people, when you, as soon as you say meditation, they think, oh, Oh, I have to get something, do something, fix something, change something, especially perfectionists. So what um, Brother Go is sharing with us is that um, that teacher suggested just sit for 30 minutes and be aware of thoughts. So I'm actually saying the same thing in my practice. I'm not, I'm not saying stop thinking. I'm not saying get rid of thoughts, stop your thoughts, don't think. You won't hear me say these things, not even in a whole meditation retreat. In fact, I'm saying the opposite. Well, not the opposite. I'm not saying just sit there and think. Be aware of your thoughts. So remember the little thing that we did earlier and we said, um, am I thinking? And then you have to stop thinking to see if you're thinking. 
So you'll actually have this experience sometimes where it's kind of like you've thought about this and you've thought about that and you thought about this and that and you went to the past and the future and at some point you kind of go, so, so what am I going to think about now? Or, you know, even you start to question yourself, why am I even thinking? Like, and then you think, but I was thinking all morning. And then I was thinking yesterday and the day before and all last week I was thinking all day, every day and then the week before that and the month before that and one year, five years, ten years, how old am I? Oh my Buddha, I've been thinking my whole life and where did it get me? <laughs> okay, I answered a few questions and I solved a few problems and I don't know but it's like this is really weird thing this thing called thinking, yet we're doing it all the time. Almost as much as breathing, we are thinking. So, what happened was, because when you're watching your mind, your mind is not physical. So, while you were being aware of your thoughts, and thoughts are abstract, and I've used that word tonight already, because I said, the stillness of the body is abstract. It's not the physical feeling of the body, it's stillness. The body is still. But I'm not saying be aware of the body. So it's not the physical feeling of the body, it's the stillness. And if you can understand how to observe the stillness, you're observing something that's abstract or even conceptual. Now if I'm looking at thoughts and I'm observing just thoughts, at some point I'm so much looking at mental states that I forget about my body. And quite often you'll have that experience where sometimes a part of your body will dissolve, sometimes a lot of your body will dissolve. A man on my last retreat said, he said, my body dissolves but I always have a head. <laughs> he said, my head's always present, but he said, the rest of my body dissolves. And it's funny because some other people, their heads dissolve and their body's present. It doesn't matter because this is all conceptual. It's actually a little a game that your mind plays. So it doesn't necessarily mean anything that your hands dissolved or disappeared, but it did mean that you, your mind was more, your mind was watching your mind. So you were in a state of either watching something abstract or watching something conceptually or even just watching the flow of thoughts that come and go. In that way we forget that the body exists and sometimes there is the, um, you do uh, not feel some, sometimes a part of the body, sometimes it can be the whole body itself. So quite a normal experience in meditation. Nothing to be afraid of. The first time it happens, it might scare you when you suddenly realize you don't have any legs and you, you know, it's like you want to cry for your mother. It's like, Mom, I've got no legs. And it's like, but then the best thing to do before your mind starts freaking out is just open one eye and have a quick look and it's like, oh yeah, my legs are still there. It's good. It's all good, Mum. It's relaxed. I've still got my legs and my hands. But it's a normal um, trick and usually it's like a little trick of the mind. Um, it usually indicates that we have a little bit of samadhi also, a little bit of concentration and that sometimes when you suddenly realize that you can't feel your body then the mind also can exaggerate that sometimes and um, yeah, sometimes you have very interesting experiences like you're lifting in the air or you're sinking in the ground or you know your body's becoming very large or very small and tiny and things like that. These are normal meditation experiences. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Jeff. Um, any other questions? Yeah. Uh, brother, do you mind using the Hello. mic so that the others can hear as well? Thank you. Yeah. Hello. Collect me. I don't know whether I hear correctly. Just now you mentioned uh, doing something without positive and negative karma. Mm. I mean, you're going for the, the middle part. I, I, am I 
what, they like to elaborate on that one and so, also on uh, purify the mind. Okay. These two. Yeah. Thank okay. you. So the when I mentioned the neither positive nor negative or the neither wholesome nor unwholesome, that is actually the state of an enlightened being. So someone who's achieved enlightenment actually will not create any more negative or positive karma. So it's also an, a description of enlightenment that you've gone beyond karma. Um, however, when we are living in our life, so the thing I said at the end was avoid harm, do good, and purify the mind. So oh, that's what you were referring to, is it? The avoid harm, do good, and purify the mind. So that's basically the same thing. So avoid that which is harm. If you feel anything in your life is in any way harmful to any living beings, then we can uh, try not to do that as much as possible. So um, even little insects and other living beings, so we talk about living beings, not just human beings. So as a human and being with humans, then we should be aware of our speech our actions and even our thoughts. These are the three modes of karma. We speak, we act and we think. All humans, we do this. Um, so if you can make sure that you're not causing any harm through your speech, your actions and your thoughts, then you are already actually starting to purify. But then you do good, which is what goodness can I do today? Who can I serve? How can I help any living beings today? So it's actually a nice thought to wake up to in the morning and say to yourself, who can I help today? What service can I give to humanity or to living beings? How can I help living beings today? It's a beautiful, noble thought. Maybe you can do something, maybe you can't, but it's nice to start the day with that idea. So you do your best to um, avoid harm, to do good, and then the purification of mind was just those little examples that I was giving you, like the, the ability to, to breathe in without any thought, breathe out without any thought. And usually when there's an absence of thought, there's also an absence of emotion. There might be some happiness there or something, but usually there's um, very, uh, it would be very rare that you would find any dukkha or suffering on an in-breath and an out-breath that has no thought. So even when you have pain, when you are more practiced at this uh, meditation, and you do, as I said earlier, you observe it, like you're aware of it, and you accept it as it is. You allow it to be, or yes, you see it as it really is. And you see these are just four elements interplaying. These are energies. This is a natural phenomenon. When you see the physicality of pain and you allow it to be as it is, your mind can calm down. And you can actually have an upeka mind whilst experiencing pain, where the mind is completely neutral, completely in balance. There's no resistance to the pain. There's no attachment to the pain. It's just the mind is purely aware of painful sensation at that moment. Then you also can have purification of mind whilst experiencing pain. I think many people wouldn't really understand that. But as a meditator, that becomes very, very clear and it also becomes very beautiful. But you can have purification of mind with any experience, as long as you are able to be purely with it. It could be hearing a sound, but you only hear. And instead of the sound being aware of the sound, you're actually aware of the hearing. And as Buddha said, there's consciousness of hearing. And if there's 
only consciousness of hearing and awareness of consciousness of hearing and there's no thought about what you're hearing, no past, no future, no other concepts, that's purification of mind. This is very beautiful. Yeah, Thank you. I mean you make your mind less disturbed. I mean, we're not making the mind less disturbed, we are just noticing that when I really see something as it purely is, there is no disturbance in the mind. It's, it's a very beautiful process and we do this through a relaxed state instead of how we would normally practice in a perfectionist way, I have to meditate, I have to observe this object, I have to stay with this object, I have to concentrate, I have to get some insight, I have to I have to meditate. With these attitudes, you can't, you actually, you're just fighting with yourself. But when you relax and you just see the in, you feel the in breath, you experience the in breath without any thought, you experience the out breath, or you hear that sound without any thought, you feel a sensation in your body, and you just allow yourself to like melt into it but be fully alert. So that comes back to that experience that I was talking about. Fully relaxed, fully alert. It's, it's like the most optimum state of mind to pretty much do any task. If you want to study, to be in that state is perfect. You'll absorb everything. If you want to do some physical training or fitness, that would I think Bruce Lee was probably a master at this state to be fully relaxed, but fully alert. You know when he's surrounded by 20 guys, or Donnie Yen, I don't know, maybe I'm, I'm a little bit too behind with uh, Bruce Lee um, scenarios, but you know, Donnie Yen even up the, up the, the level. 20, 30 guys around, completely surrounded, you can't see what's happening behind you. What do you do? You have to fully relax have to let go of everything, but be aware of everything. That's, or like a cat that's surrounded by dogs, and it's like hyper-vigilant. Maybe the cat's not so relaxed, <laughs> it may not be a good example, the cat's like... <laughs> but, you get what I mean, this, this state of being fully present, fully aware, fully alert, but actually fully relaxed. It's very wonderful, very powerful. And I think, because I'm a surfer, I think as surfers also we get, this, we get this state. And it's very, it's actually very pure as well. When you take off on a wave and, and the wave is big, it's powerful, and you can kind of do whatever you want to do, or you just, just ride it fast and, and straight. It's just, you go into this kind of a state where you have to be ready for anything, but you also have to be relaxed. So you're, you're alert, but you're relaxed. It's a beautiful state. See if you can find that in your meditation. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. I, I got an analogy in that one. Oh, good. Yeah, because you think Here's like a microphone a... for you. Hey, Dhamma is something like, you just give me an insight, it's something like muddy water. Then you let your mind settle down. Then you then it's a muddy water, but it's very clear on top. You see? Yeah, it's something like that. That's yeah. where I mean. I'm trying to understand what purified, but yes, it, it's still there, you know. Right. But you settle down. Yeah, I like it too. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. if you're patient, so if the water keeps moving and you keep disturbing the water, then it's not going to settle down, is mm. it? But if you are patient and you come into stillness, as I suggested, and you become still in body, you become still in mind, you become silent, and you allow things to be exactly as they are, the dust, the dirt, the mud will settle, and everything will become crystal clear. Yeah. Nice, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> thank you for the question. Um, anyone else have a question? Or a comment? Yeah. Or a comment, yes. Thank you. Uh, just to follow up from the question, as you mentioned, uh, 
the enlightened beings, they are in the middle way, whereby you don't create good karma or bad karma, right? But indirectly, in enlightened beings, they are very compassionate, loving kindness. So when they serve the people, it's kind of like you are creating a good karma from that action, right? So how do they eliminate that good and the bad karma? It, they're, they're doing good anyway, but for them, it's not, it's not a, uh, they don't need the good karma, they've actually already gone past it. So, and they know that there's no benefit in doing anything bad or unwholesome. They might make mistakes, they might inadvertently or accidentally harm somebody, even they could be blamed for that, but their intention would not be to do that. So what a, an enlightened person is doing is they know the path that they've traveled to come to this point and they know that if they create the conditions and causes for others to have those experiences, it will be good for them, it will increase their karma. But this one knows, I'm not doing this for my karma, I'm doing it for their karma. Yeah. So they don't, they don't get the good karma, they're just kind of sharing it with others. This is, you have to really understand anatta, the selfless nature of existence, to really understand this, this question and this explanation. And as much as it's very difficult to, uh, to understand anatta, it's really, it's really <laughs> one of the most powerful teachings that, that you can understand. And it's one of the things that really makes the Buddha's teachings different from everybody else's teachings, is the teaching of anatta. When you really get that, you, you understand, you understand how it all works. And even the one who becomes enlightened, they don't achieve enlightenment or become enlightened. They, there was nobody there in the first place to become enlightened. So an enlightened person doesn't, you know, walk around going, hey, yeah, cool. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I made it, you know, to the top or look what I did or something like that. There's, it, it's all gone because they know that there was nothing there in the first place. It's very, it's very, very powerful. Yeah. Thank you. Um, actually, Bharadev, I do have a question myself. Great. So this is about, um, because you spoke of anatta, but um, for most of us who are still, um, you know, who still have to go about our daily lives and, and adopt different identities um, in different <laughs> settings, playing different roles, uh, at the workplace, at home, then how then can we sort of like find a middle way of still having maybe a healthy sense of self, but at the same time not create too much attachment to all these different identities that we curate along the way? I think you answered your own question in, in somehow in the middle of that. It's basically, that's what you do. You, you play all the roles, but you know that actually when you understand and you have the insight that you just shared is that, you know, I'm playing this role and then I play that role and I'm like, I'm like this person in this situation and I'm like that person in that situation. Even we dress differently, you know, like, oh, I'm going to the temple tonight, oh, I'll wear my white shirt and, you know, put my scarf on or something like this. So I'm kind of like playing a role. But if I was going to the beach, I'm not going to dress like this and I may not look like this. So it's like, and then with different people, we are playing different roles. So which one are you? Are you that self or are you that self? Or that self or that self or that self? Or is there actually no permanent self, but we're just stepping into a role, we're role playing, and then we step out of that and we step into another. Then what to be attached to? There's nothing to attach to this role or that role or this, this, of course we do, but we just notice that those attachments are there. And then we, um, we allow the attachments to be there. 
again, we can practice awareness of the attachments and acceptance of the attachments, because that's what the mind does. It attaches. But then what you do is you watch those attachments and you see how they lead to suffering, how they cause you more mental stress or anguish or, you know, maybe you get what you want, but then that passes away and then you feel suffering because it's gone. So you keep watching those, um, those different experiences that come and go from each and every one of those positions. And at some point, by mindfulness in daily life, watching yourself in and out of all of these different roles, at some point you will come to understand this is all anicca, it's all dukkha, each one of these personalities and roles that I play is dukkha, and it's anatta, because I'm not this one and I'm not that one, and when I'm this one, I'm not that one and I'm not that one, but I'm not even this one. So, anicca, dukkha, anatta. If I may add on, I mean, th thank you, Sadhu, for, for that very um, insightful explanation. But um, in certain roles that I guess we play, uh, there needs to be a higher degree, relatively higher degree of attachment to it. Uh, because it comes with a lot of responsibility, it comes with repercussions if, let's say, responsibilities are not performed well. So um, I myself tend to cling to certain roles a little bit stronger. And it, in, indeed, I have, um, I can experientially verify that it is. Uh, it comes with a lot of dukkha as well, but um, the stakes are high. Uh, if if you know, like maybe I can say that I'm not willing to let go of certain identities, mm. although I know it's it's bad for me and all that. So, um, is, is there a way for us to kind of like um, recondition ourselves to fully let go and mm. accept the repercussions? Repetition, and that's why we call meditation practice because we are repeatedly doing it. And you will get the, the right insight at the right time as long as you maintain your awareness and you keep watching yourself in all of these different roles and watching the mind, watching thoughts, as he said earlier, um, you, will, you, will, you will get the appropriate insights that will actually lead you to um, taking a step back lessening a little bit. So um, what I also detected there was uh, perfectionism. I think that was um, a word that I've used a few times tonight as well. Um, there's nothing wrong with perfectionism. I am a retired perfectionist or perhaps a um, I'd like to think I was a rehabilitated perfectionist, but I don't think I'm fully rehabilitated yet. Um, but it's so beautiful when you don't have to be perfect at something anymore. And you can just go, ah, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what they think of me, or it doesn't matter what I look like, or it doesn't matter whether the stakes are high or the stakes are low. What happens if there are no stakes? What happens if at this moment, somebody said, oh, here's your ticket to New York City. You have to go there for and live there for a year. What would all these problems and things that are in your life at the moment, what would they mean to you if you were living in New York, Sydney? Sydney. Uh, you, New York, Sydney. <laughs> I like it. New York City. If you were suddenly there tomorrow, what would all these dramas and high stake things mean to you here now? They'd all be gone suddenly like that. Or all of a sudden, you got sick and you can't, you can't perform any of your duties and all you can do is lay flat in your bed and most of us have had this, this, this experience in the last few years. So, so what? You have to let it all go. But we have to practice it before we get to any catastrophe or any you know, sudden life change that forces you or rips you out of that experience. You can start to take a little step back and when you see yourself pushing too hard, just take a little step back. When you see yourself trying to be perfect at something, just take a little step back, especially with your mental attachment and distress or the idea the stakes are high, the stakes are high. You know, this, is, this could be my job or, you know, this is worth a thousand dollars or something like that. And just take a little step back and just relax. 
And when you relax and do your best, everything will be all right. And even if it's not all right, it's still all right. Yeah? Sadhu. Thank you. I hope that helps everyone. <laughs> Oh. Uh, you, you were mentioning about <coughs> watch your speech, watch your action, watch your thoughts, right? So, um, speech and action can be heard and seen, which is uh, very obvious. Mm. But the thoughts, but what is the right thoughts? Because thoughts can be kind of like monkey, you know? Uh, but be aware of that. Mm. So, when the thought seems wrong, does it mean it's a wrong thought? Mm. I'll say something that um, Chief Reverend said once in a talk. Um, yes, I was around in Chief Reverend days. Um, I was even a monk when I met Chief Reverend. Uh, he said that uh, in his sleep he killed a snake, or somebody did, it might not have been him, I don't want to misquote him. but. Killing a snake in your sleep when you're when you're dreaming yeah. is also bad karma. And I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> gee, I really need to watch my <laughs> watch my thoughts. I mean, it's hard to watch your dreams, but you also need to watch your thoughts. Now, there are those thoughts that just kind of exist in your mind, and they just come and go, and they're just a thought, and they pass through, etc. But there are those thoughts that then manifest as speech and as actions. So obviously, they are much uh, hold a much uh, heavier karma when you when you actually speak out a thought or when you act out a thought, whether it's positive or negative, pleasant or unpleasant, it's going to have its results. But um, if you thought about, you know, punching somebody or, I don't know, damaging some property or, or shouting or abusing somebody in your mind, yes, we can say it's bad karma. And there are a lot of um, uh, teachers these days, especially quantum scientists that are doing studies on the brain and um, uh, which they don't know much about the mind. They keep talking about the brain. Uh, Buddha was definitely ahead of these guys. Um, but what they're saying is that um, the, the brain or the mind doesn't know the difference between what it's imagining and what it's doing. So they're saying that this is how you can manifest things and this is how you can kind of create your reality is by, by using your imagination. But then equally, you have to be careful when you are imagining that you're going to do something harmful or say something harmful, because it's like your mind has already recorded that in your mind. So you need to be careful of your mind, your, your speech and actions, even inside your mind, which are your thoughts. So it's important to be aware of um, negative thoughts and also, of course, positive thoughts too. Yeah, but like you said, you need to be aware of negative thoughts. So even before you're aware of it, the negative already arise. So when it arises, does that mean you are creating a bad karma out of it? But as you see the negative thoughts, you are rem learning from your experience and you're realizing, oh, I have negative trains of thought or when I have that negative thought, it leads to that or it leads to that. Oh, if I catch this one, then maybe I don't have the second and third or, or following thoughts. So in that way, before I might have had 10 negative thoughts because one arose. But now I see the one and I go, ah, negative thought, the other nine don't follow because now I'm more mindful and I have a little bit of wisdom that says this is unnecessary. So I catch that thought, even I just see the thought arising, I see that's a negative thought, that's not necessary, that's harmful or that's unwholesome, then it can pass away quickly. So it's not, doesn't blow out into a full-blown negative scenario that could go on. In some people, this can go on for their whole life, that they're thinking negative things and they want to kill people and do all sorts of stuff. So we can be 
at least very happy that we're just having like one little negative thought and we catch it and it doesn't blow up into something worse and something karmically more potent. Um, but if you see the cause for negative thoughts and you see the cause before the thought arises, you see the, the cause and then the thought doesn't arise. This is also how karma works. You see the cause for a negative thought to arise and it doesn't arise. So there's a guy who keeps parking in my car parking spot. Okay, Every day this guy comes and parks in my car parking spot. It's my car parking spot. It's got my number plate on it. But he comes and parks in my car parking spot. Okay, So I'm pretty angry <laughs> about this guy who parks in my car. And I've told him, and I've told, you know, da 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 da, da. So every day. Okay, so I'm driving to work, and I start thinking about this guy who's going to park in my car parking spot. Catch that thought. And then I don't have to go into the whole big scenario of all these years, this guy, blah, 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 and getting angry and going through that whole thing in my head because I've caught that thought immediately. And I was, I'm just like, eh, maybe he's there, maybe he's not, maybe I'd get there first or, you know, eh, you know. And is it really a problem? Maybe I get another parking spot. Maybe I, you know. Maybe I sell it to him or something, I don't know. And just change it up or start sending loving kindness to the guy. May he be safe, peaceful and healthy. He's probably got a lot of problems going on in his life if he has to keep parking in somebody else's parking spot. You know, the poor guy is suffering. Start sending him compassion, sending him loving kindness. Start sending him beautiful thoughts. And then you've changed the scenario. And it's amazing when you really do that, it ends up these people just disappear from your life. They're not there anymore. Or all of a sudden your boss says, hey, I bought you this new car and a new parking spot. And you go, ah. And you don't even have to think about that guy anymore. So it's things like this where we, we see what's causing the mind to go into negativity. We catch it even before it arises. I'm driving to work and I go, oh, I'm going to think about that guy. I'm going to see that guy today. And, and then you just leave it there. The mind just drops it before it goes into the negative negativity. You're basically pretty much surrounded with all kind of st stimuli, right? How do you catch that first negative thoughts in that sense? <laughs> Go to a meditation retreat where the only thing you're doing is watching your thoughts for preferably weeks and months and, and what have you. If you're not going to do that, then do the meditation that you're doing, that is thought-watching meditation. But um, it, it, it takes practice. So it's like I said before, that, that's why we call it meditation practice, because it's something that we need to repeat and do again and again, and we start to get better at it. So even you get one little situation like I was just talking about, but then once you see that you're doing it in that situation, then you might realize, oh, when my kids don't, don't you know, wash their dishes after they've finished eating, then that's another situation that, that makes me angry. Or maybe you start seeing when you start to feel sad or when you start to feel afraid or when you start to feel stress. So you start to see those situations. So you apply the same principle, but in different areas of your life. Mm. So in that way, you start to become more mindful. And it could even refer to the different personalities or, or roles that you're playing as well. So, so these are changes that once you practice it so perfectly, that the first negative thought itself wouldn't appear. It, it, can. it can. It can. Definitely. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And there are some times when you, at least when I was a monk, there were times when I just, it would be like a week or something and I'd go, I don't think I was angry this week. <laughs> was I angry about anything? And I was like, I couldn't remember. I couldn't remember if, like, it wasn't because my memory wasn't good. It was just because not okay living a monk's life is is pretty quiet but things still can make you angry you know like just 
someone parking in your parking spot. No, um, you know, somebody's done something that is apparently yours or something. There are times in your life through this practice, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, where you get to a point where you realize, oh, I can't remember the last time I was afraid, or I can't remember the last time I was sad, or the last time that I cried, or the last time that I was... Um, and it doesn't mean that we become emotionless, it's just, just things are just the way they are, and they come and they go, and they come and they go, and actually everything's all right. So, yeah, definitely this is, this is a result of the practice. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Brother Jeff, for You're your welcome. answers. And thank you as well, brothers and sisters, for your skillful questions. And that's all the time we have tonight. Mm. And uh, we would really like to thank Brother Jeff for giving us this very inspiring Dhamma talk um, to guide us on how to fully relax and yet be fully aware, therefore planting the causes and conditions for wisdom and realization to arise. Mm. So um, we hope you have all benefited from the talk. And let us say sadhu three times together again out of gratitude to Brother Jeff. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. sadhu. sadhu.